First time I'm feeling hastily and thank for the First of all, I would like to cordially thank uh, you for the invitation. It's a privilege for me to uh, talk to you about prosperity. I would like to apologize. I will uh, not give my lecture in German, but believe me, in English, it will be much better if I can speak prosperity English. Prosperity without growth. Uh, is such a thing even possible? Many economists would certainly tell you uh, that it is not, that it is an anathema, that progress itself is about growth. And um, never mind that an ecologist, to an ecologist, the idea of a system that grows forever is itself um, a contradiction. Our received wisdom about the way our society works, the way economies function, the way that we expect our aspirations for the future to expand, is all about economic growth. So to even ask the question, prosperity without growth, is already to ask something somewhat dangerous. Bad things happen when economies collapse. Uh, you need look no further than the crisis, the financial crisis, the uh, near global recession. And um, to those countries, particularly in Europe, of Greece and Portugal and Spain and Italy, the reality of the crisis is very much still with us. In fact, if you feel that the crisis is gone, it's probably because you're living in Germany. Um, where you managed somehow to create an economy that was uh, more stable, where, where consumers were less voracious, where you saved more money, where you invested better, where you still have a, a vibrant manufacturing sector, where you produce goods that the world still wants. And some of them, it has to be said, are, are, are not um, voracious gas-guzzling cars, but, but also some useful technologies for a new, a more ecological world. So in Germany, you have a little bit of cushion for this, but actually, even in my own country, this is from last week, the week before last. Um, this is extraordinary sights in a town very close to where I was born. I used to go ice skating in this town. I bought my first present for a girlfriend in this town. It was our day out as 16-year-olds to, to visit uh, this place, which is now in the matter of a few days, on the back of a, one single incident, which seemed, in some sense, at the time, unfortunate but harmless, sparked uh, riots across London. You undoubtedly have seen these pictures in the press. And although there were, I think it's fair to say, many factors that contributed to this, the shooting of an innocent man, the uh, dissatisfaction of... Uh, a, a, an area in London with high unemployment. Quite clearly, some deliberately criminal elements, looting and greed, and indeed um, some political activism that, that was opportunistic, that took the opportunity of, of this incident to create unrest. Although there are all these factors, there is also something extraordinary here, that 13 and 14-year-old children have been, for the last year and a half, out on the streets protesting against what they see as an unjust political response to what? To economic collapse, to economic crisis. Austerity is the language of our government at the moment. And yet austerity has created new divisions between the public sector and the private sector. It's created new divisions between profit earners and wage earners. It's reshaped public space. It's withdrawn social investment. And it has, to some extent, laid, I would argue, the seeds for this kind of unrest, an unrest that I doubt we have seen the last of in, in the UK. And of course, austerity was the response to the economic crisis itself. Austerity was the uh, government's answer to a debt that had spiraled out of control. It was the government's answer to um, unemployment rates that were rising very fast. It was the government's answer to uh, a sense of crisis in, in monetary markets, in financial markets. It was the government's response to a lack of investment. It was an attempt to instill confidence back into the economy, to get growth back again, precisely because growth is the thing 
that we need in this conventional worldview in order to keep our economy stable. John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s argued that the principal task for the economy is to maintain social stability. And quite clearly, a government that reneges on its possibilities, on its responsibilities for social stability, is not doing its job properly. So arguably, the government's doing what it should do. It's giving us austerity. It's trying to get growth back again, because growth is the model on which austerity is built. And that is a lesson that comes from this crisis that we have seen over the last three years. In, uh, New York in 15th of September, the day that Lehman Brothers uh, collapsed, um, stock markets responded, the financial crisis began to, to, to arrive, if you like. This was the, the moment of truth for the financial crisis. But actually, its roots go much further back. They go back at least to the expansion, the monetary expansion that signaled a rise in consumer debt. They go back to the creation of toxic financial derivatives that became unmanageable and unstable. They go back to, of course, the lax behavior of the financial regulators who allowed this to happen. They go back to unscrupulous investors who want a fast return for their buck, who want profit without taking the risk, who want to transfer risk actually from the private sector onto ordinary taxpayers. And that, in fact, is exactly what happened through the crisis. Governments bailed out the banks because they were too big to fail. They created government debts that will haunt us, haunt our children for decades into the future. And again, when you ask the questions, why was this allowed to happen? How could it get to this stage? Actually, the interesting thing is that much of this behavior was motivated ultimately by the desire for economic growth. Much of it was motivated by the desire to expand consumer spending. Much of it was motivated by the need to create export industries, to have uh, housing uh, markets that were vibrant, to expand economies, to create jobs for people. Much of it actually was a form of self-harm. This was growth undermining growth. This was the system itself reaching limits to its own viability. And this, therefore, is a point at which you have to ask the question, should we, is the solution to this crisis, is it actually growth itself? Is growth the solution to a problem that ultimately was caused, was part of the architecture of a growth-based economy? Isn't this actually the behavior of addicts, to return to the behavior that caused the problem in an attempt to solve the problem that was caused by the behavior? This is classical addictive behavior in, in that very precise sense. And even if you reject my argument that growth undermines growth in these financial terms, I doubt if anyone here would particularly um, contest the fact that growth in the long run, growth of the kind that we have in the long run will undermine growth through the destruction of resources through the degradation of soils, through the pollution of water supplies, through the collapse of ecosystems, through the loss of biodiversity, through the changing of the climate. These issues are haunting our economy even at the size it is at the moment. And yet if you accept the conventional solution, more growth, then you're looking at an economy that by the end of this century is some between 80 and 200 times bigger than the economy uh, of only a few decades ago when I was born. This is an extraordinary um, expansion of activity on a finite planet. It's, it's creating extraordinary pressures on our environments. And so in a sense where we find ourselves is caught in a trap, a kind of dilemma. The dilemma is this, that growth is unsustainable. At least the growth that we've had in the long term is totally unsustainable. And yet degrowth, the opposite of growth, uh, is, is unstable, risks being unstable in our existing system. And I think what, one of the things that I would like to um, 
make very clear to you that is that this is a profound dilemma. It's not a dilemma where we have any sense of comfort, either from easy ecological solutions ready on, off the peg to be plugged into our existing system, nor indeed from within the system itself. The ecological challenges, the financial challenges, the economic challenges, the social challenges of this dilemma are huge, and they, they are, to my mind, one of the most important questions, perhaps the most important question of our time. This dilemma of growth is a difficult place to be. There's no doubt about that. What is the, what is the default solution here? Let's take um, the conventional view of a butterfly trapped in a room. <laughs> um, the, the default solution to the dilemma of growth, that's, that's rather unfortunate, isn't it? There's no uh, escape hatch here for this black butterfly. There's a wonderful uh, metaphoric interlude here. Um, the default solution to, to growth is, is, to the dilemma of growth, is that because the idea of doing without growth is just too difficult to contemplate, Let's keep growth, but let's make it greener. Let's make it cleaner. Let's decouple uh, its impacts from the environment. Let's use technological efficiency. Let's use our own cleverness as a species to escape from this trap. This, this is the default solution, dematerialization, decarbonization, decoupling, it's called. So economic growth can continue to go up, but by doing things more cleverly with better technologies, we can continually bring our impacts down again. And, and this strategy, I have to say, is a very important one. It is absolutely clear that we need to dematerialize our economies. It's absolutely clear that we need better technologies. It's absolutely clear that we can't solve these problems um, without investing in different kinds of technologies. But before we get too carried away with this strategy and think that it's possible to keep growth, we should at least ask ourselves the question, how much of this cleverness do we need? How clever do we need to be? And here is a little thought experiment. I want um, momentarily for you to imagine a world of nine billion people. That's the mid-range projection for the middle of this century. Actually, the UN has just upgraded that projection to closer to 10 billion people by 2050. That's a lot of people on a finite planet. And let's allow them, why should we not allow it to them, the possibility of the same kind of lifestyle and aspirations that we have in the West. So let's allow them a Western-style income. And let's accept the economist's proposition that income should grow at, let's say, 2% per year. Um, then, then we can ask a very simple question. With those conditions, 9 billion people all aspiring to an equal income, all growing at 2% per year, how much carbon reduction, how much carbon efficiency do we need in order to meet just our climate change targets? And here's a little exercise uh, that, that puts some numbers on that. The, here on the left-hand side um, is the carbon intensity of our economy today. Um, around 768 grams of carbon per dollar of economic activity. So for every dollar of economic activity worldwide, on average, around 770 grams of carbon are going into the atmosphere. In this world that I described to you, of 9 billion people all aspiring to Western incomes, all growing at 2% per year, if you want to meet the carbon targets that have been set out by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you have to drive your carbon intensity down a factor of 130-fold to around about 6 grams of carbon per dollar of economic activity. That's a, a huge response in a very short time scale. It's at least 10 times faster than anything we've ever managed technologically in the course of industrial history. And then, of course, if your economy is growing beyond that, you have to drive that number down further. In fact, by the end of the century, you have to have a carbon intensity, I apologize for the technical concepts here, that is less than zero, a negative carbon intensity. What does that mean in practice? Well, to those of you like me who don't like negative numbers, it means basically this is an economy where every dollar of economic activity, instead of pumping carbon into the atmosphere, is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. This is an economy we know nothing about. We know nothing about its 
industrial processes. We don't know how it works. We don't know what its products are. We don't know what life is like. We don't know what people are buying. We don't know how to live in an economy which is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. We have no economic model, anything like close to this idea of a society that is drawing carbon out of the atmosphere. I, interestingly, I'm not going to stand here and tell you it's impossible. Actually, I've been in situations where particularly young people have said to me, well, let's just get on and do this. This is a challenge. You can see it visually. Here on the left is where we are. There on the right is where we want to go. Let's just go there. And I think there are very good arguments to adopt that, that we do need to invest in these technologies. We do need to go there. So I'm not saying it's technologically impossible at all. But I do think that we should ask the question, is this possible in our kind of society? Is it possible in our kind of economy? Does our economy deliver this kind of technological change? And here I want to delve, and I apologize for this, a little bit into the dynamics, the system dynamics of, of how economies work, and in particular, how economies connect to us, to people. And it goes a little bit like this, that firms produce goods for us, for households, for people. And they also provide us with incomes, which is very useful because we can spend those incomes on more goods and services. Um, interestingly, though, and this turns out to be an absolutely critical point, we don't spend all our money. And I've already alluded to the fact that in Germany, you're better at not spending your money than we are in the UK. The other thing we do is to put money into savings, and savings go into investments. And investments turn out to play a abs an absolutely critical role in how economies work. In particular, we've used investments a lot in the last few decades to attempt to increase productivity. In particular, we increase labor productivity so we can do more things this year with the same workforce that we had last year, which is great because it means everything is becoming more productive. We're producing more goods and services with the same number of people. But the trouble is if that productivity grows, it also means that uh, if we don't grow the economy, then somebody finds themselves out of work. And already here you can begin to see how the dynamic of degrowth works. If labor productivity increases and growth doesn't increase, unemployment rises. It's a very simple algebraic relationship. But it has some good sides. One of them is that it brings down prices. And bringing down prices, ah, well, that also encourages us to spend, uh, uh, to buy more things because they're cheaper in the economy. And already you see that this simple circular flow that I've sketched here has within it a dynamic that tends towards an increase in uh, the consumption of goods. And there's another, actually, even more important point, um, that this investment in new processes and uh, new consumer goods is a kind of what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction, a continual turning over of the old in favor of the new, continuing building of new consumer markets, new consumer products, novelty. Novelty is something that signals hope to us. It gives us a brighter, shinier future, better gadgets, bigger houses, more faster cars, better holidays in the sun. All of the stuff of progress is aligned with actually, in some sense, this pursuit of novelty, this creative destruction, this turning over of the old in favor of the new. And it's as much a process for firms, for entrepreneurs, as it is for us. It, it has uh, a place in our hearts. We love new things. And we love it not just for this abstract view of a uh, shiny, better future. We love it for the status that it brings us, the links to our friends, the social relationships with our communities and those around us. It plays a role, of course, in status consumption, to have those newer devices, those faster cars, those better holidays. That matters to us as individuals, as people. Um, it's a dynamic that, in some sense, is odd because it's filled with anxiety. The anxiety of the firm is continually to be ahead of the game. If you don't engage in this process of novelty creation, you find yourself somehow failing in the market and risking capital flight. But it's also an anxiety that sits in us. Actually, 200 years ago, Adam Smith highlighted this, this anxiety as a sense of shame, the idea that we might go out in public without a linen shirt 
in Adam Smith's day um, was, in, in a sense, an appeal to the idea that we have within us the possibility of social shame, that if we don't have the right stuff, if we don't send the right signals, if we're not there living our lives in the right way, if goods don't provide a kind of language with which we talk to each other, um, then we risk a sense of shame. A life without shame is how Adam Smith described it. So that even, actually, if we feel that we, we, we are happy in ourselves, that we can resist this shame, that we don't need this new stuff, we find ourselves exposed to forces, the forces of advertising, the forces of investment, the forces of persuasion, persuading us actually to go out and spend money and providing the means to do that through what? Through this expansion of credit. The expansion of credit that created the instability, that led to the financial crisis, that caused economies to, to, to reach a point of near collapse. And this was the picture in my country um, just before the crisis. Uh, personal debt had risen to a point where it was above the GDP for three years in a row, and the household savings ratio had plummeted so that just before the crisis, it was actually below zero. People were drawing down their savings and expanding their debt just to stay in this consumer game. A very simple and familiar story of, of people like us being persuaded to spend money we don't have on things we don't need, to create impressions that won't last on people we don't care about. It's a pathology put in those terms. And it's a point of reflection, I think, at which we have to ask ourselves seriously, not is this technologically possible? Not is this desirable? Not is this something that we can avoid but is this kind of society really the society that we want? Is this really what it means to be human? And I think as soon as we ask that question, we're drawn immediately to uh, the deficiencies of the economic system itself. We need a different kind of economy. We need an economy that pays more attention to saving and investing than it does to spending. We need an economy that seeks its benefits and its returns in terms of the services that are provided to people. We need an economy in which social and ecological returns are the measures through which we judge our investment. We need an economy that concentrates on people's abilities to flourish. I don't have time to go through the economics of that, the fundamental economics of that, but I want to point really just to what I regard as the core dimensions of it. And one is around actually this very simple idea of investment, investing in the future. Investing, investment actually is the primary economic relationship between the present and the future. It is the, it is the point of departure for thinking about an economics which itself thinks about the future. So this idea, actually, that we need to reform investment turns out to be one of the planks, one of the building blocks for a different kind of economy. And the second building block, it seems to me, is to rethink what we mean by enterprise. Enterprise, in the conventional sense, where we invest to create productive assets that produce more consumer goods that people are encouraged to buy more of is exactly at the heart of the failure of our existing economies. But what is enterprise for? What are goods for? Are they not actually to provide services to people, to contribute to our quality of life, to provide health and education and social care and recreation and leisure? At the end of the day, it's not the stuff itself it's what lies behind that that we're after. And of course, there are material functions that we have to fulfill. We have to have homes. We have to have roofs above our head. We have to eat well. We have to sustain ourselves. We have to be healthy. Many of these are physical, material functions. But much of what I've described in this pathology of a consumer society actually is about social and psychological flourishing. It's about our identity. It's about our sense of meaning and purpose. It's about our ability to participate in the life of society. It's about having a sense of, of meaning 
and purpose in our lives. And these social and psychological tasks actually are not very well fulfilled by material goods. They're not very well fulfilled by the vast majority of enterprises creating stuff to be consumed on a finite planet. So the idea actually of creating ecological enterprises, enterprises that concentrate on human services, on health, on education, on social care, on recreation, this, these, this provides us with the second of my two foundations for a different kind of economy. When you ask, when you put these two things on the table, you could ask yourself, well, can we not just do this and get growth back? Actually, both of these things have been suggested by quite conventional economists. The idea of a transition to a service-based economy is part of the transition of Western economies over the last 20 or 30 years. The idea of investing in low-carbon technologies was put forward during the crisis as one of the means to stimulate, to re-stimulate the economy, to get economic growth back again. So there is a, a possibility here that, you know, if we're very, very clever, we can take these two avenues, we can take these two pillars of a new economy, and we can create something different, something that gives us back a growth-based economy. My suspicion, and I don't know that anyone has really done the numbers on this, my suspicion is that getting growth back here is difficult, partly because these kinds of investments don't show the financial returns that are expected in the conventional financial markets. And so we will definitely need, we will need um, to reform those markets. We will need investment markets that measure social and ecological returns. We'll need financial markets that don't take risks on, at the cost of the public purse. We'll need uh, a sense of, of ethical investment to, to be built into our framework for the capital markets. And we will need that investment sometimes actually not to show the financial returns that we've become associated with. This investment is investment in the long-term ecological and social assets on which we depend. And likewise, interestingly, ecological enterprise may not give you back growth in the conventional sense. Let me just sketch very briefly why. It turns out that when a doctor sees a patient, the value of that relationship is in the contact between the doctor and their patient. It turns out that when teachers teach in schools, it doesn't make the quality of the teaching better when they have ever bigger class sizes. It turns out that when the Berlin Philharmonic plays uh, one of Beethoven's symphonies, it doesn't make it better if they expand the size of the orchestra. It turns out that actually growth doesn't make so much sense. Productivity growth doesn't make so much sense in these enterprises which contribute genuinely to the quality of our lives. And so what we have here, actually, interestingly, is a set of activities which can be ecologically light, carbon light, resource light. We have a set of activities which really contributes to people's flourishing in a very real way. And also we have a set of activities which provides jobs for people because it's not forever chasing jobs out of the market by pursuing labor productivity. It is, in fact, the kind of economy that we might design if we were thinking about it from scratch. It's the kind of economy that might put people at the heart of what economic activity is about. It's the kind of economy in which enterprise can provide meaningful capabilities for people to flourish. It just doesn't give you back growth so easily. But does that matter if we're employed, if we're working, if we are enjoying our lives, if our aspirations are met, if our social relationships are strong, if our communities work, if our health is vibrant, if we have a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives? I would argue that it doesn't. These are, uh, to some extent, abstract ideas, and you might say to me, well, where is this world? Where is this wonderful set of enterprises? Where is this new sense of investment? I would say, uh, without spending too much time, that it is already here in an embryonic sense. So here, for example, shared interest is um, an investment uh, enterprise that works particularly in the third world. It was the uh, financial vehicle for fair trade, and uh, it's, it's a, a, an investment vehicle which puts justice above profit in the way that it's organized, which shares between producers of third world goods and the consumers of third world goods the benefits of that relationship. It's a very specific vehicle which sits outside conventional 
economic investment vehicles. Here's a, another example of this. This is completely the other end of the spectrum. This is a mainstream institutional investor who has said to itself, I want, we want to have ethical investment. They've created their own ethical investment fund and they're now spearheading this initiative of a sustainable stock exchange to try to create ethical investment across the board, to bring the rest of the capital markets to a point where you're not penalized for being ethical. Here's a very small example from the United States. This is the Unified Field Corporation, a small-scale community investor that shares its returns with the community, that doesn't leak profit continually out of the enterprise into private pockets, but shares the dividends from the activity with the community. This kind of B corporation, as they're called, benefit corporation in the States, social enterprise is the term used in Europe, is already in existence, is already working. And here, at the international level, Yasuni. Yasuni is um, a rainforest uh, project in, in Ecuador, and a couple of years ago, the Ecuador government said, okay, you don't want us to cut this rainforest down and extract the oil, the valuable oil that's underneath it. If you provide us with half the value of this uh, oil, then we, the Ecuador government, will provide the other half of that value and we will protect that rainforest and we will not extract the oil from it. Ecuador was asking the global community to pay not to extract oil from the ground, to protect the ecological assets, to invest money actually in the future of our planet by protecting this rainforest. And at the moment, they, are, uh, they have a target of $100 million uh, by the end of this year, Plan A, to protect the rainforest. Plan A, to protect the rainforest, will hold if they reach this target of $100 million by the end of the year. At the moment, they are at $40 million. So if anyone feels like investing in a project uh, that, that is an ecological investment, that is really signaling something different about how we measure and value returns than the Yasuni project, which has just opened its, its coffers to the smallest investors. You don't have to have masses of money to do this. And so for that reason, uh, this is actually the target for uh, some of the royalty sales from uh, the paperback version of, of Prosperity Without Growth of my book. 10% uh, of those sales are going to uh, rainforest protection. These are examples not of abstract ideas about a different kind of economy, but of people creating this economy from the ground up now. People actually are not the kinds of human beings, the kinds of species that economists often see them as. We're not entirely those novelty-seeking individual consumers. We don't always have voracious appetites for stuff. Sure, we think about ourselves sometimes, but as the best social psychology tells you, actually that selfish instinct, even if it is laid down by evolution, has always been countered by an altruistic instinct, by a regard for others. Our selfish behaviors always balanced against other regarding behaviors. Our novelty-seeking behaviors, again, adaptive in evolutionary terms, always balanced against a concern for tradition, for stability, for conservation, for the conditions that lay down strong, healthy, vibrant families, communities, and societies. We would not be here. We would not have evolved to this point if our psychology was locked in the upper right-hand quadrant of my diagram. And yet this is mostly where economy works. This is mostly where e economics works. This is mostly our vision of who we are, that we are novelty-seeking, selfish individuals. It is belied by the best of our scientific knowledge. It simply isn't the case. And actually, when you look at this diagram, it's like a kind of map of the human heart, if you like. You find that uh, here also lies the solution to create institutions that better protect the social aspects of our behavior, to create institutions that found our societies not just on novelty, but on tradition and conservation, to create an economics fit for purpose in a world of finite resources. At the end of the day, this was a few days later in London, this reality of people 
creating social environments. This picture went viral uh, within about 24 hours of it being taken. This was an army of people who turned out in their hundreds, thousands, with brooms. <laughs> Just a very simple symbol of change, of, of, of cleaning away, of, of recreation, of reconstruction. The humble broom became a viral symbol, actually, of people reclaiming public space, reclaiming the damaged places of our economies, reclaiming a sense of health in our communities. And to me, it's, it reinforces, really, the point the prosperity is not about having more stuff. It's not about having bigger economies. It's not about continual, endless growth on a finite planet. It's not about the destruction that that reaps. It is about our ability to flourish as human beings within the ecological limits of a finite planet. September 2009, President Sarkozy said the crisis doesn't only make us free to imagine other models, another future, another world, it obliges us to do so. I think there is a sense that he captured here of a responsibility that we have at this point in time to deliver a better economics, a better society, and a better vision of who we are as human beings. Man danke ich Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Und freue mich auf Ihre Fragen. Thanks, sir.